What did FinTech set out to achieve? Was it to pick some pieces that financial institutions dropped to make it into a digital business? Or was it something bigger than that? Hi, this is Takatoshi Shibayama, the host of the Future Design Podcast. In this episode, we have Nareen Hayat, co-founder of Tess Financial Services, a new bank based in Pakistan, on a mission of financial inclusion for its people. When I talk to her, I feel her true north principle. She says it's her responsibility to the world to provide financial services to the people who need it. She talks about business strategies, and it could be a guiding tool for everybody who's on a social mission to create an inclusive society. So stick around to the end. Future Design Podcast. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is our second attempt to do this episode. First time we met in December of last year, and then we tried to do it again in April, but network connections didn't allow us to do it. Financial inclusion has been a really interesting topic for me. I use the word interesting, but more of a passionate uh, topic for me because I've been thinking about how I can get into this uh, industry as well because I started thinking about uh, when, I, when I first thought about uh, cryptocurrency, which is a little way different from what you're doing, but when I thought about cryptocurrency, I thought about you know, a lot of com- countries in developing nations which have very promiscuous or actually defaulting uh, economies a lot of people would need to save money. They need to preserve their wealth through different means. And a lot of times that the providers of, let's say, a a currency that is not uh, from their country, it's usually U.S. dollars, but the U.S. dollars are usually given by banks. And when the banks shut down, they have no other means to preserve their wealth. So, you know, these things really kind of uh, got me thinking about what financial inclusion is, and that's why... I wanted to reach out to you to understand, you know, bits and be- bits of this world and how financial inclusion is actually being done. So thank you very much again for being on the show. You're most welcome. The pleasure is all mine, Dr. Thank you. Yeah. And in Pakistan, you've been building this business, Tez Financial, for quite some time now. And what do you think is the underlying problem of why in countries like yours that you have a, a layer of people who are underbanked or unbanked and why is that the financial inclusion financial institutions cannot service these people oh uh, so i think um with uh, pakistan um there, there are two aspects to it this one is um, the financial institution perspective and then there's a customer a customer perspective if you are to speak about the financial institution perspective, I'd say, you know, for the longest time, the issue really has been uh, a legacy system issue and also a mindset issue. Um, so, you know, these financial institutions have become very comfortable, uh, primarily banks, um, in, you know, in earning off um, the investments in government security because, you know, that's really gotten them the returns and that too risk free returns. Uh, and, you know, if you are today look into why they have deterred from reaching the masses, it's primarily because, you know, they have higher risk and these institutions do not have either, you know, the credit history or suitable collaterals or even suitable risk rating tools to understand uh, the segment, you know, these masses. And that's why they've really been averse in reaching out to them. If you really think about the perspective of the customer, uh, so there's, there's a few issues that underlie there. Yes, there, there, is, there lies a trust deficit. Um, you know, so there's a lot of paperwork and documentation issues that lie at the end of the financial institution, which um, due to which these customers deter from really going to uh, the branches. On the other hand, uh, one of the major challenges here is that institutions have for the longest time and still do have a one product fit all methodology. Um, so they're not really in individualized products that they've developed for the longest time. And um, since the customer needs are not met by the financial institution product, they don't find a need to really go to them um, and get those products. So that's, that's, that's another major issue that's really uh, existed for the longest time. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I'd say has been, you know, the gap and the reason why these institutions haven't really served these markets. Mm, that's, I understand. And I guess a lot of the f- physical locations 
also is important as well, going out to these rural areas and opening up a ATM or a physical branch is very difficult when, the, when you're service in the community, when you think that, oh, maybe I can just service a bigger corporate instead because it's much more lucrative and why do I need to service these people in these rural areas when, when there's so much little to that they can actually get from them. And also, I also think about in the customer side as well, I understand that documentation and all these complicated procedures that need to be need to be addressed before they get onboarded onto a bank's as a customer. The education is also, I feel like that is lacking as well. Obviously, these people are very busy working very hard and they don't have the time to think about, okay, what am, what am I going to do to secure my future financially, you know, other than saving money. So what do you think that digital transformation has allowed Tez Financial or a lot of the kind of non-bank neobanks out there uh, in terms of educating the financial literacy of the people? Uh, so, yeah, I think very rightly pointed out, uh, financial literacy is definitely a challenge. Um, and I think before I come on to say is, um, it was important to note that, you know, prior to, you know, digital, um, fin uh, digital financial services coming into being, um, so there has been uh, a sector, the microfinance sector, and you have microfinance providers that have really tried to um, penetrate, you know, that segment of the market where, you, you need a uh, financial literacy really to be instilled. So I think a financial, uh, these microfinance providers definitely have played a role in building the basis for, uh, you know, setting that financial literacy um, amongst these people. That said, yes, it's still limited as compared to, you know, the overall population, but they definitely have built in those inroads. Now, if you are to talk about, um, digital, you know, the, the potential that digital has to uh, really enhance literacy or to reach the masses is vast. Um, but that happens once, you know, you actually have provided that service first into the market, and then you really, um, pro uh, pro you know, you, you provide that knowledge or understanding of how that service is going to be. Uh, so, um, you know, we feel that with pays and, you know, all the entrants right now, we, we have a responsibility to the industry overall. And I think the first movers will always have that industry. And, um, you know, what they'll have to do is they really have to take the brunt of it, you know, the likes of even branches, banking providers. I think they've, ha they've done a great job in building, um, you know, that, that understanding of at least some, certain financial products, even if it's payments. People have started to understand this, and once you know these new these new entrants, the first entrants build that, only then can the industry benefit as a whole. Uh, and I think that's what we're really trying to do. Of course, we have to face losses in the making as well, but I think overall, in the long term, it's um, it's worth um, it's it's worth the the sacrifice I'd say uh, for the overall industry. Mm. Yeah, it's always the first movers, always the blazing the trail. Of course, it doesn't always necessarily contribute to higher profitability, but definitely I'm sure the impression that you give to the people who are you're trying to reach out to, that makes the stickiness of the business. Now, in, in, while we talk about digital transformation in your country, uh, we've spoken briefly about how quickly and how big the digital transformation happened in your country with the use of smartphones and 3G and 4G. Can you, can you give us a little bit of data on how that looks like in your country at the moment? Absolutely. Um, so digital definitely has uh, really grown leaps and bounds in Pakistan. Um, if I'm to share some numbers, um, you know, we have a teledensity of about 79, 80 percent. That's one of the highest in the region. If you were to talk about smartphones, um, you know, we have about 79 million smartphone users in Pakistan. And then 3G, 4G coverage, um, over 90% of Pakistan is 3G, 4G co coverage. So these really lay the building blocks for, um, you know, digital transformation to begin with. And I think we have that infrastructure lay on which, uh, you know, companies, digital um, financial service providers like ourselves are capitalizing upon. And so I think uh, we've done fairly well as a country um, 
in building that digital railroad and you know all of us are now trying to uh, use that outreach in uh, serving the mass call right and obviously that building block is super necessary for any emerging market countries Pakistan to me sounds like it's way ahead of certain emerging markets in Southeast Asia there are countries that still have a penetration smartphone penetration rate of under 50% as well i think that's about to be you know completely changed over the next several years in your mind when you're building out this industry what is the most important thing that you have to think about when you think about growing this business so obviously not everything is digital digitalized obviously physical cash is probably one of the main uses of cash and not everything has gone digital you have to create a credit history but if that's all offline it's very difficult to build that what are the things that you're really think is the problem to tackle at the moment well i think we have a few um challenges i'd say um and so you know you you mentioned um number one the problem of um, why cash and not digital um so you know we we have a big cash economy we have a parallel economy that's based on cash we talk about currency circulation about 40 billion dollars uh you know worth of uh, our uh, currency still is in cash in circulation now one of the major reasons i feel um why people haven't really the masses haven't really shifted from cash to digital is number one for the longest time uh, digital has been more expensive than cash until and unless you don't make it cheaper or you don't make that pull factor for people to actually start putting in their money into digital or converting into digital you never see that flow happen number two um, you know i you really need to build in that use cases uh, you know that surround the life of a, an average pakistani and just convert that and take them that from physical to digital and then the those use cases are not built completely other than the payment side only you never see people you know really shifting to digital to be able to just transact their daily requirements on the digital platform so that that's one of the major pieces that i feel is missing and i think um, then if you do go into nitty gritties um, there, there are lots of other angles that are imperative here that um, really i think shift the fo- uh, focus more so on to industry participants um and here you know i i talk about uh, partnerships and collaborations to be able to you know capitalize on each other's core competencies for example uh, you know you you've got banks and then you've got the fintech um so and then you've got the telcos and the larger companies so i think it's it's very important for these players to come into sync so that they can really um reach the masses by building those use cases um even if that means collaborating on different levels not only integrating for products but also you know having more open initiatives even when it comes to data sharing or you know um it, so i think data sharing or otherwise sharing of um, resources or sharing of overall you know um uh, the the insights that they could actually utilize to help each other reach the masses even if that means analytics so i think there's a lot that can be pursued um and i think it's just beginning to happen in pakistan right i always find that collaboration you know in the older older days was very difficult to do because of how g- companies were really driven by you know dominating the market and and monopolizing the market whereas i find that you know people who are in this industry like yourselves are more open to collaboration because maybe information is quite scarce or you need to when you need to scale obviously partnerships is much easier to uh mm-hmm. scale your business so can you tell us a little bit about what kind of partnerships or what kind of companies that you partner with yeah uh, so there is um you know our vision really is to be a platform and when i say platform um it's not only using our own app our own platform to send our services to the masses but really to um enhance our outreach by partnering to various players and so far what we've done is we've partnered with you know branches banks and payment providers um you know that means uh, the likes of there the easy pesa jazz cash upl 
um, you know, SimSim. So these are not only banks, but also fintechs um, that provide us that payment platform um, and makes us uh, an agnostic platform so that our customer can, you know, um, enhance their outreach in terms of cash in and cash out uh, for us for, for us to be able to use the persons and repayments. So that, that's one thing we're doing. We've collaborated with banks also to be able to provide our uh, finance products with credit and now soon, you know, savings also to their platforms. So that's another thing that we, you know, have um, now explored and those collaborations are now in place. And soon we'll be, you know, providing our services through some banking apps as well. And then, yes, of course, telcos. Um, so, you know, some of the telcos, uh, we, we've already started partnering with them. And we're trying to see, you know, how we can actually uh, utilize those bases to, uh, you know, reach a wider audience. And you know, last but not the least, insurance companies. So we recently launched uh, our insurance vertical, and uh, you know, we're we're um, serving as the bridge between insurance companies and the masses, and we're extending um, you know services like health insurance, life insurance soon, and uh, you know, within the health suite also some other um, health related the health related services such as doctor online consultation. So a lot happening, um, and you know, we're really exploring these partnerships and trying to build around it um, to utilize them to the fullest. Yeah, that's amazing. It's it's quite exciting to hear that you're partnering with so many different verticals of the industry. And now that you're selling these insurance and investment products uh, through your applications uh, with partnerships with others, I go back to the question again about education. So people who are in these kind of brackets of, of society you know, they don't have the access of knowledge about what insurances are or what kind of investment products they need to invest in. Obviously, some might not even have the capacity to to invest in these things as well. I mean, how do you reach out to people to educate them, to get them to understand that these are the products they actually need to spend money on rather than stashing it away or maybe reinvesting in something else? Um, so there are two things, two aspects to it. Number one is, uh, you know, number one, what kind of customers are we targeting? What kind of segments we're beginning to target? Uh, and the other segment, uh, the other aspect is, how do you really make these people understand so that they become your segment? Uh, so, so the first, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bank on smartphone data to our own anal analytics and reach uh, segments, um, you know, to our um, to the AI that we understand how how and what kind of services can we really offer them, um, you know, so that for example, if they have some extra cash or they have um, you know something to spare, they can they, they can actually those are the people that we can target for let's suppose insurance. If someone fell ill, um, you know, let's suppose you know we we see through our analytics if you know these people um, let's suppose made a visit to the doctor or, or a hospital. So those are the kind of analytics that we're trying to use to be able to serve them services, financial services that would match their needs. Now, you know, that's actually the ultimate vision to begin with. But if you are ready to talk about how you enhance that literacy, I think um, that's one of the toughest areas to target right now. And with us being, you know, some of the first entrants in the market, we see that not only as a challenge, but also as a responsibility. Uh, because, you know, financial literacy overall has been very low. And, um, you know, the first entrants always have to face that the brunt of, uh, you know, those losses because people really don't understand how the financial products work. So, you know, I think it's, it's trial and error, a lot, a lot of trial and error initially, uh, because, you know, we, we really have had to take this mammoth task of teaching the customers who come into us, along with, you know, others in the industry. So. I think we're trying to lay those building blocks and, you know, this ultimately for the industry will be more beneficial in the longer term. Uh, we are trying to, you know, deploy various um, kind of techniques, which includes, you know, trying to um, trying to create that awareness to our social media ch uh, channels, whereby we, we create content to make them understand what that financial service is all about. We, you know, we recently, we, we are now part, we partnered with, um, you know, some multilateral agencies um, to develop some um, online content. So we're working on, you know, video series um, on based on financial uh, uh, service literacy. And so, you know, we're trying to build that slowly, slowly and build that content to teach the masses as well. 
the very early days overall for the industry. I think it's it's going to take time till we can really build that uh, you know that financial um, uh, capital amongst the customers. Yeah, and I'm sure while you're bu building this business, there's always not always a one way you know road to profitability and and growth of the business. I'm sure there's a lot of roadblocks and various obstacles on your way, but what makes you very excited about doing this business? Because obviously you're doing a social good, but there's there's always something inside of you that probably keeps you going. And could you share us uh, mm -hmm. about that kind of um, you know, journey that you're going through? Well, um, it's been quite uh, an exciting journey. I think um, it, it's not been, um, a very smooth ride. I think that's what entrepreneurs need to be prepared for. But what's really kept me going is, um, and the reason why I, um, you know, I even stepped into this was, um, and I, I, you know, I say this often, is that I believe, uh, you know, that the purpose of life is really larger than oneself. Um, and, um, you know, I think each one of us has a role to play um, in whatever we are doing, however big or small it might be. Um, so I think um, financial services, um, providing basic financial services to the masses, for me means um, means a tool to economic empowerment. And I feel economic empowerment is one of the most important tools to help people um, ultimately succeed in the longer run, only, not only for themselves, but also for their household and their families. And so what we're doing is, you know, we're really just trying to play a role in helping these, the masses, primarily these low and middle income households, um, you know, to meet their day-to-day -day needs, even if that means, you know, being able to pay for food or, you know, something as essential as medicine or even pay for education, you know, these, these are basic rights um, and people are not able to meet them because they, they don't have access to these financial services. So I think that's really um, what keeps me going. Um, and I think it, it, it's a responsible, it's more of a responsibility I feel that I have. Um, and I think I'm just playing my role, um, the least I could do right now, I feel. What are some of the experiences that you had um, when running this business? Maybe it's about your customers that really made you happy. What made your day? You know, I think uh, I've had a few people ask me that question. And um, I usually struggle to answer that because I think I still haven't done enough, to be honest. Um, but I think, uh, you know, with time, we've, we've been hearing stories of our customers and, um, you know, the appreciation of how our services has helped them in a time of need. Um, you know, even brought a smile to someone's face, you know, it just, Met, met their basic needs, you know, as, in, you know, in a time when others, their, their families or they themselves couldn't help them. I think that was something that has been, um, you know, that's, that's really um, provided me that satisfaction for even that moment. So, yeah, I think, I think that's what really kept me going. Yeah, that's very touching. And, uh, you know, I, I really do love the social good that you're trying to do and you feel it as a responsibility. And I, I feel that passion from you. And for individuals like us, you know, we're living in a developed country like Singapore and I'm from Japan. I mean, I never really lived in a emerging country before, but you know, and a, a lot of, a lot of us are also having the same experience, but we do hear about financial inclusion in this world and we do want to participate in one way or another to help out people. I mean, what do you think that we can do as individuals or even corporations that, um, that are in, in um, not even in the financial industry to participate in how to uplift people out of these uh, income brackets? Um, I think that a lot can be done. Um, and I, it's already being done also. I think there are various fragments all over the world who are trying to you know, do their bit. Um, and I think it also, it really depends if you're talking about institutions like ourselves, it really depends on uh, the stage of that business. Uh, you know, uh, it could be 
it could range for something from something as essential as funding, for example. Um, you know, um, since that's that's essential in, in a market like Pakistan, for example, where the scope or the potential is so huge with, with a mammoth population and a mammoth population in need. Um, so I think uh, definitely, um, you know, my shout out to investors. This is really the market to look into, um, you know, for various aspects of consumption, be it financial services or otherwise. And then I think you talk about corporations. Uh, I think partnerships is the way to go. So you, you do see, you know, partnerships happening on various levels, be it, um, you know, um, for, uh, B2B partnerships, or be it in terms of, you know, lending, using their services, services from outside of, you know, these countries, be it in data science, consultancy, or, you know, other, um, other um, coherent uh, products that, you know, institution can work on together and provide in countries like ours. And I think uh, last but not the least, um, uh, I think the individuals. Um, so then again, I think um, uh, the support matters a lot in um, building awareness around, you know, um, companies like ourselves or even building awareness, um, you know, international in international markets about, uh, you know, what the base level reality of countries like Pakistan is, because I think, um, for the long for the longest term, I think there there has been a lot of uh, negative media that's boomed around. Uh, people really don't understand what the base level realities are. So I think that's only through uh, dialogue and um, conversations with people from this part of the world that they really understand. Uh, you know what um, an average uh, citizen of a country like ours is, and we just understand that you know we're all just the same human beings with the same needs. Um, and I think it just opens up. Um, mindsets, it opens up economies, it opens up dialogue, and ultimately opens up collaboration. So that that would be, you know, my um, my humble um, ask. Yeah, well, geopolitical concerns. Maybe not so humble, but uh, <laughs> no, definitely, definitely humble for sure. But uh, definitely, the geopolitical calamities that happen between various countries obviously it does not reflect how people are, right? And that's just politics and. And there are people just like you and I anywhere in this world uh, that would need some financial services that can uplift their lives. And what you say about uh, corporations, even you know countries uh, that we are in, can really offer our help by partnering them, whether through technology or content or many different ways that uh, we can participate. Which I think that could be an eye opener for a lot of companies when they're thinking about what can I do more for the society. So. Thank you so much for your insights, and I, I I really am rooting for you to succeed in your business and fulfill your responsibility. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Hi, this is your host, Takatoshi Shibayama. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed or disliked the show, please let me know by writing in the comment section. The only way I can improve or add value to you is through your voices. If there are any topics that you would like me to pick up, please also let me know in the comments. I'd love to start chatting with you all. And if you would like to continue watching the show, please subscribe. Thank you.